So the webinar training schedule is as follows. You all are tuned in to the Farm to School 101 webinar. Um, there are also two additional trainings. You do not have to attend both. I will say if you are a backup reviewer, you should be attending that reviewer training that's slated for Wednesday at 2 p.m. Um, if you are a reviewer, you are also attending that training. Um, and then our team leads, they will have their training on Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. As I mentioned, this webinar is going to be recorded, so if you cannot make the live webinar, you certainly will have access to the recordings that will also happen next week. I also strongly recommend that everyone who um, doesn't get a chance to attend in person that you watch all of the trainings by January 22nd, so you are well prepared and ready uh, for the review period once it begins on the 29th. So for today's agenda, we are going to go over what is Farm to School, what are the benefits of Farm to School, and we'll talk a bit about the Office of Community Food Systems and the various buckets of work that fall under um, our purview. And then we'll certainly introduce the staff that conducts this work. Uh, and then we will open it up to any questions that folks may have. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Andrea. Hi, everyone. Uh, like Maika said, my name is Andrea Northup. I'm based here in Denver in our Mountain Plains Regional Office. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what is Farm to School and, and just some general Farm to School background. And I know that many of you are really familiar with Farm to School, and you're thinking, gosh, why do I have to sit on this Farm to School 101 webinar? Well, you might hear a new example, a new concept, or a new framework that might help you as you're reviewing grant applications. So stay tuned. It's going to be a fun presentation, and I appreciate your time. So what is Farm to School? Uh, typically, we think of Farm to School as efforts that incorporate local food in school meals as well as food education for students. And another way that I like to think of it uh, actually first came out of the rock stars for in the farm to school world in Vermont. And it's the three C's model. Um, we talk about classroom, cafeteria, and community. And what this means is we want to serve local food in the cafeteria in those school meals. We want to weave food, nutrition, and agriculture education into everyday classroom lessons, and we want to engage our community members. And school gardens kind of fit squarely in between all three of these C's because they can provide food to the cafeteria, they can be a learning classroom in themselves, and they tend to really engage our community members. So we're not just talking about local food in school meals, we're also talking about local food in some of the other federal child nutrition programs we work with, such as the Child and Adult Care Food Program, which serves um, younger children, our Summer Food Service Program, so meals and programming during the summer for kids. Like I said, we're talking definitely about school gardens and engaging kids in hands-on garden education. And we're also talking about taste tests, food education in other, in other ways than just the garden. A farm to school activity might be a farm field trip, so bringing students out to the farm so they can learn firsthand where their food comes from. And visits from farmers to the cafeteria. This farmer here is actually showing the beets she grew to students who are about to try those beets in their school meal. So the exciting thing about this three C's model or this very general definition of farm to school is that each community can take that definition and make it their own. And you're definitely going to see a lot of that happening in the grant applications that you review. I'm going to give you just a few examples from my region here, the Mountain Plains. So in Ferguson Florissant uh, School District in Ferguson, Missouri, 
they really wanted to use Farm to School as a tool for engaging and employing high school youth. So during the summer, the school district actually hires high schoolers as part of a culinary job training program. And they learn knife skills and cooking techniques, and they preserve local foods during the summer for the school di district to use throughout the school year. The Intertribal Buffalo Council works with schools all over the region to incorporate more buffalo meat into school meals and to remind kids about the traditional importance of buffalo in the Native American community. So they do culinary trainings with school district staff. They bring in farmers and ranchers to talk to students about the bison and get kids out actually to visit bison ranches uh, on the reservation. In Livingston, Montana, Farm to School is a way to bring science education to life for high school students. The students help design an aquaponics system that grows fish in harmony with fruits and vegetables uh, in the greenhouse right outside their, their school. And they learned all about you know, pH, soil levels, nutrient context, content, how to, how to take care of these fish. And in the end, they were able to sell the fish to local restaurants. Um, they're working up to selling that fish directly to the, back to the school district. So great way to, to bring science to life for the school district. Greeley is uh, an agricultural county here in Colorado. In fact, they're one of the top producing agricultural counties in the country. And so the Greeley Evans School District Farm to School program is all about sourcing as much local food from neighboring farmers as possible. So they're looking at legumes, meats, fruits, vegetables, you name it, uh, in order to really give that money back, put that money back into the community where they live. So these are just a few quick examples of how communities across our region are really taking that farm to school program in the unique direction that makes sense for their community. So again, like I mentioned, um, it's really not just that local food and school meals. We're really encouraging farm to school programs to weave food education in. And, and I think you'll see that a lot in the grant applications you read. Um, you want to make sure that these farm to school programs are not just focusing on one or the other, but rather weaving both together to have the biggest impact. Okay, we're coming upon our first quiz. What are the five components of a reimbursable lunch through the National School Lunch Program? So use your chat box to enter A, B, C, or D, and I'll give you a minute to um, respond to those. All right, I'm seeing some I'm seeing some responses coming in. All right, I'm seeing oh, I'm seeing a couple of different responses. But I think the majority of you have it right. The answer is indeed C. Um, and we'll explain that here on the next slide. So the Richard, the Richard B. Russell School Lunch Act um, is, is, a, is a law from 2010 that updated the meal pattern that schools have to follow when they're serving school meals. So what happens is when a school chooses to participate in our federal meal program, they serve a lunch that contains all five meal components, a fruit, vegetable, meat or meat alternate, grain, and a milk. So these five meal components must be offered to students and they must serve, the, the student must choose at least three of those components, one being a fruit or vegetable, in order to count as a reimbursable meal. The schools are reimbursed by the state agency each month for the number of meals they serve and that reimbursement rate that the school receives per meal is tied to the income level of the students. So when you hear about free, 
reduced or paying students, that is indicating the income level of the child and therefore the reimbursement rate that the school district will receive from the state. Here at USDA, we administer that program on a national level uh, while the states administer it at the local level. So what this reimbursement means is that basically schools have, on average, a $1.35 to spend on food per meal. And they can use that money to either contract with a food service company to serve those meals or serve those meals themselves as a school district. So when they're serving school meals, schools can choose to incorporate local foods into any or all of those five meal components. So whether it's meat, fruits, vegetables, you name it, a school district can find that product locally and can serve uh, feature local foods all across the lunch tray. How are schools typically sourcing local food? Uh, many of them receive the bulk of their food through a prime vendor or distributor, which, which is uh, basically a company that provides all sorts of food service products uh, on one truck. And those distributors can have local foods available to schools. A management company that coordinates school meals for a district can incorporate local foods. Uh, a school district could work with a processor to incorporate a local food. For example, they could work with a salsa manufacturer to incorporate local tomatoes into a salsa that's provided to the district. Schools can buy directly from farms or farmers markets. They can also receive foods through our DOD Fresh or USDA Foods program, which are physical foods that the government provides to schools to supplement their school meal food dollars. We're seeing a lot more producer co-ops and food hubs so, uh, sourcing food to local schools, and a school garden or a school orchard can also be a great source of food and educational value. So who defines locally when it comes to farm to school? Uh, basically, that is up to each individual school district. So this is, you're going to definitely see this when you're reviewing grant programs, um, grant applications. Um, it's really up to that school district. We here at USDA or anyone at the state level are not defining what local means. Um, that definition can also change by product, by season, um, and it can really vary uh, depending on the school district and where it's located. So as you may know, it takes a village to make a farm-to-school program happen, especially a farm-to-school program that incorporates local procurement and food education. So here are just a few of the key stakeholders that might be involved in a farm-to-school program. So you'll definitely see a lot of these folks woven in to the grant applications as you review them. So now we're going to jump into a few of the benefits of farm to school. And I'm sure you've heard a lot of these benefits before. Um, you know, farm to school programs have been studied a lot in the past. So there are a number of uh, peer reviewed research and, and articles out there that demonstrate some of these impacts that farm to school program can have on students, on the economy. Uh, and on the school meal program itself. Okay, we are on to our second quiz question. How much did schools in the U.S. spend on food for school breakfast and school lunch last year? Any guesses? Okay, I'm seeing some A's, some D's, a D with a question mark, <laughs> um, oh, a B here. I'll wait another minute for a few more guesses to come in. All right, they're kind of all over the board. Well, folks, the correct answer is $10 billion. 
Schools spend about $10 billion on food per year. And, and this is schools all across the country spending their food dollars on just breakfast and lunch. So this isn't even including snack and supper. So this is a big, this is a big number. And this is, this is something that um, we like to bring up is that basically 32% of all schools in the U.S. report buying local food. Um, and, and we have a huge school school meal dollars uh, budget here that, that has a lot of room for expansion when it comes to investment in the local food economy. Basically, when a school spends a dollar on local products, that results in between 40 cents to $1.60 in additional local spending. So that farmer who received that dollar is taking it and reinvesting it in his own staff or her own staff, um, you know, spending that money locally so that it recirculates again and again. So this is, I think, one of the most um, exciting benefits of farm to school is this economic multiplier effect. When we look at the fact that a school districts spend about $900,000 each year on local foods. That, I'm sorry, $900 million on local foods. And we look at that multiplier effect. Um, we're talking over a billion dollars in local economic activity each year generated by farm to school programs across the country. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about USDA's Office of Community Food Systems and our role in the farm to school realm. So that same 2010 law that updated the school meal pattern and the, the meal components that schools have to serve in order to get reimbursed by the federal government, it created a farm to school program that distributed grants um, like this USDA Farm to School Grant Program that provides training and technical assistance to schools and other entities and disseminates research and data on farm to school programs. So I'm going to talk about each of these three areas and how our office contributes to them. Our general vision is that every child in every child nutrition program has access to local food every day. So our grants, our training and technical assistance, and our research and evaluation are all designed to advance this mission. Let's start with technical assistance. On our Farm to School, USDA Farm to School website, we have some great fact sheets and resources available. They're also available in print, and they're also available by way of trainings from our national office and regional leads for various farm to school stakeholders. So we really try and make uh, our, our federal resources easy to understand, uh, visually appealing, and we bring them out to the, to the local level um, through our trainings and our, our workshops and webinars. One of our great resources is a farm to school toolkit. And this really walks a school district that is just getting started with farm to school through the process of visioning what they're looking for, building their team, um, fleshing out their goals, and turning that into action. So if any of you are very new to farm to school, I would, I would recommend browsing through our farm to school toolkit because it provides a really great framework um, for getting started with farm to school and conceptualizing your farm to school program. When it comes to research and evaluation, our work is largely focused on the USDA farm to school census. So the census is a survey of every school in the country to learn more about what sort of local procurement activities they're participating in and what they're doing for school gardens and food education. So our last farm to school census was in 2015, reflecting data from the 2013-2014 school year. So what we found was that 42% of school districts across the country are participating in some sort of farm to school activity. 
And so, you know, over 5,000 districts own over 42,000 schools. Um, so the, the word is definitely spreading out there that farm to school is, is a good idea for our school districts and our communities. We are aiming to do our next farm to school census in 2019, so definitely stay tuned for that. Some of the high level statistics that we found in that census was that fruits and vegetables are obviously the, the most um, incorporated into school meals locally and milk, baked goods, dairy, and, and now we're seeing a lot more meats are also being incorporated into school meals. Schools are using a lot of different mechanisms for getting that food from the farm to the school. Like we mentioned before, distributors are actually that um, the most likely to be supplying local food to our school districts, um, along with a number of other mechanisms. And schools are reporting a lot of different positive benefits of farm to school activities, ranging from uh, community support for school meals to reductions in food waste. Okay, now I'm going to hand it back to Maika to wrap up our Office of Community Food Systems portfolio of work with the Farm to School Grant Program. Thanks so much, Andrea. You, you made pop quizzes really pleasant. <laughs> I feel like typically they can be not so pleasant, but your, your voice and the introduction made them seem fun and exciting. So thank you for that. Um, so as Andrea indicated, um, we have three buckets of work that fall under um, the purview of the Office of Community Food Systems. And so the last one that we'll cover at this time is the Farm to School Grant Program, which is what draws all of you to this Farm to School 101 webinar. So the Farm to School Grant Program, uh, the first year in which we made awards was back in fiscal year 2013. So this year um, is actually our sixth cycle. We're still a little green, um, but to, this, to date we've actually funded 365 projects that actually span the entire United States of America, which is really exciting. So we funded projects in all 50 states, in the District of Columbia, Virgin Islands, as well as in Puerto Rico. And actually, we, we funded our very first um, project in Puerto Rico just last year. So these 365 projects actually total um, just over $25 million, almost $25.5 million. Um, but we are actually quite the popular program. So to date, um, and this doesn't even include the requests that we got um, this fiscal year, the ones that you'll be um, reviewing, um, but we've received requests for over 1,600 projects, um, and the amount of money sought totaled over $120 million. So to kind of break that down into more digestible um, kind of tidbit or fact is that basically last, last fiscal year, so fiscal year 17, for every five applications we received, we were only able to award one. So very steep competition. Um, so for fiscal year 18, we've actually received almost 300 applications. So we are so super thankful to have all of you as volunteers pitching in to read these fantastic proposals and really pick out the gems that we will fund for this year. So on this slide, you'll see um, this beautifully designed um, cover page to our summary of grant awards. And actually, this one is from our fiscal year 13 through 15 cumulative review. But each fiscal year, uh, we actually release our summary of grant awards, which kind of captures the trends among um, the applications that we receive each year. And it kind of just gives a high level of how many applications have we received to date, where are we making um, selections or awards, um, and what are those high-level activities that folks are being funded to do? Um, and which entity types are receiving this funding? So all of that fantastic information can be found in um, this particular uh, report that we put together each year. So that can be found on our Farm to School website on fns.usda.gov forward slash farm to school. 
so each year um, for the Farm to School Grant Program, and let me take a quick step back to say um, we are an annual grant program. Uh, each year we award $5 million in grants. Um, the highest award cannot exceed $100,000. And so each year um, in our request for applications, which is that formal document that applicants use to review and understand the requirements of um, receiving of being considered for funding um, from the Office of Community Food Systems, in there we, we uh, enter what are the priorities uh, we are seeking to uphold in the selection process for that particular year. Our priorities can shift from year to year. Um, these aren't too terribly different from last year, but just wanted to provide everybody with an overview. So we're seeking to um, prioritize applications from school districts. We actually are committing ourselves to ensuring that at least 50% of the awards go to school districts for fiscal year 18. Um, because we really want these monies to impact um, school districts and school meals, the school meals program. Uh, we also are um, prioritizing applications from state agencies um, with the thought or motivation that we want to institutionalize um, farm to school work at the state level and state agencies are a fantastic um, entity type um, through which to, to spread that work at the state level. In addition, we want to make sure that our funds are having as big of an impact as they can. So we definitely make sure to take an eye to um, are, are the projects that are being submitted reaching more than one school. It doesn't mean that if, if an application is only touching one school that they can't be awarded, um, but we certainly are looking to prioritize those applications that do touch more than one school. In addition, um, as is found in that authorizing language that um, Andrea kind of discussed at, at the top, the Richard B. Russell School Lunch Act, Section 243. Um, in that language, it says that these funds are really um, intended to impact um, communities that um, are high poverty or high need. And so in the grant application packages that are submitted to us, uh, those folks are providing us with data that indicates for the target population or the communities that are going to be served through these funds, um, tell us um, how many or what proportion of those children are eligible for free or reduced priced meals. So through that indicator, we're able to get a sense of whether or not the project is touching a high need community or not. And we certainly want to prioritize those that are um, high need communities. Last but certainly not least, uh, we are um, prioritizing applications that are submitted by Indian tribal organizations um, or entities who um, are serving Native communities. Um, so in a nutshell, that those are our priorities for fiscal year 18. And the one thing I wanted to kind of impress upon you all, you may be thinking, man, like, how do I juggle all of these priorities when I'm reviewing my application? Well, first, what's really nice is that these priorities, um, the weight for these priorities are not um, applied by you all as reviewers. We in national office actually apply this weight after um, scores have been submitted. So you don't have to worry about that. We in national office will ensure that these applications are prioritized um, according to these priorities. <clears throat> So another important thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind is kind of what is the structure of the Farm to School Grant Program? Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar with our RFA, Request for Applications, um, we actually have several grant track types. So when you are saying to yourself, I want to get money from the Office of Community Food Systems to do Farm to School work, you have a decision to make. You have to decide which of these three grant tracks grant track types you are going to apply to, because you can only apply to one during a fiscal year. Um, so each of these grant types actually have different expectations in terms of the kinds of activities that are to be found in the proposal that's submitted. So really quickly, I wanted to provide everybody with a quick overview of each of our grant types. So the first being um, the planning grant track type. So the real uh, intention uh, behind this grant track type is that it's really for folks or organizations, entity types that 
have little farm to school experience or have not done farm to school work in the past but are looking to do so. Um, so if they are to receive funding, they are essentially uh, using that time to collect data, engage stakeholders, determine who should be on their farm to school team, um, identify gaps, um, gaps in knowledge, gaps in support, and really thinking critically about how to be solution oriented for those particular obstacles that they have to face, um, as well as piloting and testing ideas. So, you know, potentially doing market research to figure out what local foods are available in my area, who are those local vendors, um, and then once that information has been gathered, during the course of the planning grant to actually test some of that. Maybe students will enjoy um, local apples more than local protein. So really kind of figuring out, you know, what will work best before actually going forth and launching that farm to school program. So to emphasize, planning grants are for planning, uh, less about implementation. Um, so that's an important thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Uh, the next grant type is the implementation grant. Um, this is for more seasoned folks or for folks who already have a, a fully conceptualized project um, or they're looking to um, expand existing farm to school efforts. Um, so activities can include procuring um, additional local foods. Um, perhaps they were already pr procuring local foods, but now they want to launch a garden or now they want to do integrated curriculum. Um, so it, the, the possibilities are really endless, um, but this is more about executing on the work. And then last but not least, we have training grants. Um, so these, uh, this particular grant track type is set up uh, for folks to be able to uh, plan and, and host um, state or regional or even national level conferences or trainings that bring together folks um, to, to learn more about various topics in farm to school. So that could include culinary skills, um, local procurement trainings, um, school garden development, um, the, the possibilities are really endless. And what we have found in the past that folks have used uh, these trainings as ways to um, break down barriers and silos uh, across the various stakeholders that are involved in a community food system and that are involved in um, making a farm to school project successful. So that can be bringing together uh, food service directors or food service staff as well as agricultural producers or manufacturers or distributors or co-ops. Um, really getting folks in the same room so that they could understand the language of one another and understand ways to better communicate with one another in order to bring in uh, more local foods. I wanted to flag for folks, um, I'm glancing at the chat box. Um, in previous years, we've had what was called a support service grant, and you may be wondering, what happened to the support service grant? Um, we actually decided to streamline and simplify our RFA and to collapse the support service grant into the implementation grant. Um, so support service grants were very similar to implementation grants. They were just for a very specific entity types. So we collapsed it into implementation and made everyone eligible for the implementation track. Um, so just in case anyone was wondering about that. So one of the things we wanted to kind of equip you all with um, this time around is kind of some equal playing ground or kind of some tidbits or hallmarks that you can kind of hold on to while you're reviewing your applications. Farm to School is it's pretty big. Um, there, there are a decent amount of activities that can fall under the farm to school um, umbrella or branch. And we really wanted folks to have an understanding of when you come across certain content areas in your farm to school application that you're reviewing, what are some questions you could have in the back of your mind as you're reviewing that application and trying to process, hey, did they you know, dot all their I's and cross all their T's and are they really thinking comprehensively about about this, this project they're, they're putting forth. So there are three content areas that I'm going to go through right now just to kind of um, give folks um, some tips and advice um, in terms of things to pay attention to when you see these content areas in your Farm to School applications. Before I go on, I want to highlight, in case anyone's getting a little anxious, um, we do have tools for you as team leads and reviewers um, to use as you're going through your grant applications that will allow you to, to allocate points 
um, to an application. So you think of this as like something to layer on to those um, uh, score sheets that you'll be using, um, but uh, you will have very uh, helpful tools that will guide you in how to, to score your applications. So let's dive into these content areas. So for local procurement, if you come across an application that talks about local procurement, here are some things you could kind of keep in the back of your mind as you're reviewing that application. Um, is that applicant um, talking comprehensively about their local procurement strategies? Are they talking about the methods by which they're going to determine what foods or products that they're bringing in? And are they talking about what products and foods that they see are seeking to bring in? Um, also, it's important to kind of keep in the back of your mind um, you know, does this applicant have an understanding of what's locally available in their area? If they don't, do they have a plan for, for how they intend on identifying what's locally available in their area and who their local vendors are? Um, is there any forethought or insight given into how they plan on integrating these local foods into the school meals program? Um, are they, in terms of that integration, are they taking into account student acceptance and student engagement? Are, there way, are they talking about taste tests? Are they talking about engaging certain student bodies to figure out you know, what local foods would be more successful in the school meals program than others? Are they thinking about their staff and their facility and equipment capacity? So are their food service staff is their food service staff equipped and trained to handle the influx of local foods that are being brought in? Their facility, do they have you know, refrigerators? Do they have storage space to actually keep that food on site? Um, and then do they have equipment capacity to actually process those foods? So if you're bringing in whole apples or bringing in uh, fresh produce, do they have the cutting instruments or the processing instruments in order to um, get those foods prepared um, for, for service in the school meals program? Additionally, we want to make sure that applicants are thinking about their promotional and marketing plan. Um, it's great that they're bringing in local foods, but if no one knows, then it, it, it's not it does them a disservice. So are they talking about their promotional and marketing plan? As Andrea said, it um, takes a village uh, to make a farm to school project effective. So um, some key potential stakeholders you might want to be looking for when you're reviewing um, applications that talk to local procurement um, or are seeking funding to improve local procurement or do local procurement. Um, is the food service director involved? Is there any mention of school administration? Um, if, you know, for some schools they leverage a food service management company to manage their school meals program, so is the food service management company involved in this farm to school project at all, um, as well as food suppliers and students? So now, shifting to uh, projects that may involve school gardens. Um, gardens are always really exciting, such a great hallmark of um, farm to school work, um, and a really great way to kind of integrate the community. Um, so, you know, in that application, are they talking about a thoughtful garden design? Are they talking about, are they thinking about, you know, the temperature um, for their particular region or area, and are they aligning that with the kinds of things they intend on growing? Um, so really thinking about thoughtful garden design. Um, as well as thinking through um, how to maximize the impact of that garden. So some folks may decide to grow those foods and then harvest them for the use in the school meals programs, while other folks will uh, really try to leverage that garden for educational opportunities. So integrating math and science concepts or ag agricultural um, and nutrition and culinary education, thinking about ways to bring in students into the garden through after school programs or to extend it out to the broader community through um, family engagement. So really, you know, asking yourself, is this applicant really leveraging this garden to its maximum potential. In addition, it's really important to, to, to ask yourself as you're reviewing an application, you know, is this applicant thinking about, all right, once school is out, how are we going to keep the garden up? What's the plan for the next year? Um, we want to make sure that gardens don't die at the end of the school year, but that someone is tending to them um, throughout the whole entire year. So is there a plan for summer maintenance? Um, is there a plan for garden sustainability long term? Sometimes projects can just hit, uh, be hitched onto one passionate person. If that one passionate person leaves, you know, 
does it seem that this project is integrated in a way that it can continue without that one passionate person? So some key potential stakeholders to keep in the back of your mind for school gardens when you see that in an application is, you know, is the food service director involved? What volunteers are being plugged in? Um, what other support organizations from the larger community are potentially being involved? Um, is the school administration on board? And, you know, potentially what do teachers have to say, especially when it comes to educational opportunities um, with curriculum integration and agriculture and uh, nutrition. Okay, so projects involving experiential activities and curriculum. So um, obviously we want to see educational we want to see educational activities and curriculum that revolve around agriculture and nutrition. We're not looking for, you know, hair education or <laughs> other random topics. Um, physical activity is wonderful, but, you know, the intention of this funding is really around um, agriculture and, and nutrition education as it relates to farm to school. So really having um, students understand where does their food come from and then, you know, in, Curriculum integration is kind of taking that to the next level and really making it a part of the school's DNA. So how are we integrating math and science concepts, um, kind of the core concepts that schools are being held accountable for in terms of teaching their, their, their students and preparing them for the next grade level. Um, with these kinds of projects, you, it's important to ask, you know, has this um, applicant given thought to how teachers will be trained, how teachers will be brought in, are teachers bought into this project? Um, also paying attention to the timing of curriculum, are these new classes, are these concepts being you know, incorporated into existing class time, is this happening after school, and kind of what are the repercussions of the timing of this? Um, as it relates to how it was laid out in, in that project. Um, you know, sometimes folks get really excited and they want to develop their own curriculum, but, you know, it's also important to ask yourself as a reviewer, you know, does it feel like this individual thought about existing curricula um, and if they could have tapped into that, if they're developing their own curriculum, you know, do the folks who are working on that curriculum have the expertise to execute on that? Um, and really thinking about how to integrate this into policies so that there can be a long-term impact um, of this work beyond the end of the grant. So some key stakeholders for experiential activities and curriculum, uh, school administration, definitely having them on board, teachers, are the teachers on board, um, as well as any um, kind of community uh, community-based organizations, support organizations that could pitch in on this work. Okay, so now we are up to kind of talking about who is behind these three buckets of work. So training and technical assistance, um, research and evaluation, and the grant program. Who's doing this work here in the Office of Community Food Systems? So we um, have staff that is based both nationally as well as regionally. So as you can see here, this is our national staff. The Office of Community Food System is um, headed up by our director, Erin Healy. Um, we have Matt Benson, Matt Benson on board on detail as our senior technical advisor. Um, and then we also have Erin uh, Heisum, who does our training in technical assistance with a focus on the school lunch program and the summer food service program. And then we have Janelle Walker, who d does work on our communications, our evaluation work, as well as technical assistance for uh, the child and adult care food program. We are all based in Alexandria, um, the Park Center uh, office. It's time for a quiz. I hope you guys are ready. Um, so how many USDA farm to school regional leads are there across the country? So go ahead and use your chat box. Is it A6? B7, C8, D9. Okay, so I am seeing quite a few of you typing in. I see a lot of Bs. I see some Cs. I see a question mark. <laughs> All right, good job. For the most part, folks did in fact guess B. There are seven um, USDA regions and we have a regional lead in each one of them. 
And so our regional leads are pictured here for you. We have Jenna Siegel, who is the regional lead out of the Midwest. We have Daniel Fleury, who is out of the Northeast. We have Tegan Bernstein, who is out of the Mid-Atlantic region. We have Sam, who is Sam Samantha Benjamin Kirk, we all call her Sam, um, out of the Southeast. And then you see my face again, but Rachel Spencer is actually our Southwest Regional Lead. She is out on detail currently, but I am filling her very big shoes as the interim Southwest um, Regional Lead. Um, and then we have Juliana, who is the Western um, Regional Lead. And then last but not least, who has been my fantastic co-presenter, Andrea Northup out of Mountain Plains. Okay, so we certainly gave you all an earful and a lot to, to, to think about and chew on. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we left some time uh, for Q&A. So at this time, um, if you can go ahead and use the chat box to type in any questions you may have, um, this would be, tr be your time to do so. I'm also going to tap in Andrea. Andrea, are you still there? Hey, I'm still here. Um, you know, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you for volunteering to be reviewers. Um, we're so excited to have a great group. I see a lot of familiar names of Farm to School rock stars and USDA colleagues from around the nation. Um, special shout out to my Mountain Plains folks. Thanks for stepping up. Um, we're just so thrilled to have you and appreciate um, you are going through all these webinars and working with us to make sure that we review these grants um, really effectively. And I just echo um, Andrea's sentiments. As I said, we received almost 300 applications and obviously a team of seven regional leads and four national office staff plus a director cannot <laughs> review all of this application. So we certainly would not be able to take this huge undertaking on undertaking on without all of you. So thank you for your dedication, your excitement, your passion for this work. Um, it's incredibly import important and we couldn't do it without you. So at this time, I'm going to turn us over to Q&A. I see that we do have some questions uh, queued up. Uh, for those of you still chewing on things, you have some time to, to develop your questions. So I see a question here that asks, are these ranked in order of importance? And I, I'm assuming that this was the FY18 priority list that yeah, we had yeah, going. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, no, they are not ranked in order of importance. They, that was just simply a list. I probably should have bulleted that <laughs> instead of putting numbers. And so um, to give a little bit of insight, the way that we apply that priority kind of varies. Um, so it's kind of a percentage by which we would um, award folks that fulfill that criteria. I see another question here. Um, it, sa it states, what about state agencies that are not allowed to apply due to state government limits? Is there consideration for those states? Andrea, do you have a response for this one by chance? I think this is one that we would have to answer on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the state agencies that I've worked with in my region um, have been able to find ways to apply to our grant program. And uh, Amy, depending on what region you're in, I would recommend you work with your regional lead and with Maika to figure out um, if there's an issue going on there. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. As a reviewer, will I be looking at applications from different grant tracks or within one? All planning, no training, for example. Fantastic question, and more to be, or more to come, I should say, in the um, trainings that are happening next week. But um, Mary, rest assured that you will receive um, grant applications from all within one track type. Um, so you won't be comparing kind of like apples to oranges, you will have all of the same uh, grant types um, assigned to you. I see another question here. What is the attitude toward serial applicants? 
say an organization which got a planning grant in a past year and is coming back for an implementation grant? Um, that is a great question. I, we've never referred to them as serial <laughs> applicants. I like the phrase. Um, but actually, so for FY18, it was the first time we implemented a formal past grantee policy. Um, so in the RFA, we stated that if you have received a farm to school uh, grant award in fiscal year 16 or 17, you are ineligible to apply for funding this year. And that was just um, in light of the fact that our grant program is so popular and has such high demand that we wanted to make sure that we allowed folks, uh, that we didn't have folks applying that were likely to not be selected because they had received recently received funding from us. Um, but if you have received a planning grant in the past, you are still eligible uh, to apply for a grant this year. So that's the only exception, planning grants. Uh, okay, I see another question here. Will these keep in the back of your mind items be provided along with the score sheets? Yes. Yes, they will, Michelle. Great question. I will make sure that that is a resource for you all and you could reference them along with your score sheet and other um, evaluation instruments. Um, I have a question from Tori. Do you have trainings like this available to the public? Um, so no, these trainings that are specifically related to uh, the Farm to School grant training process or review process, these are not made publicly available. But we certainly do host um, a number of other um, technical assistance webinars and resources that talk about our work and um, things that we have posted on our site and how to conduct Farm to School work effectively. Um, Andrea, did you want to add to that response? Yeah, Tori, I would say that um, trainings like this are a, a large part of the role of the farm to school regional leads. So I'm constantly going out to my 10 states that I work with and providing really tailored trainings um, that help advance farm to school in those states, uh, specific to the challenges that, that folks in that state are facing. So um, yes, these types of trainings are available, um, but the specific grant reviewer trainings are just for you all as reviewers. Thanks, Andrea. I have a question from Anne. Where can we access the video of this presentation if we need to reference it again? So Anne, I'm going to be sending out a link to this recording once it's available. Um, but what's really fantastic, and I'll go into a little bit more detail next week in the reviewer and team lead training, is that you all are going to have your very own website. And it's, it's going to be hosted on PartnerWeb. Um, we are in the process of making accounts for everyone um, who has registered. Uh, and there you will be able to um, easily access links to previous trainings, the slides, um, and any additional support materials like score sheets and the point allocation guidance. It's all going to be hosted there. Um, but until you all have access to PartnerWeb, um, I will be emailing out all of these resources to you all either end of this week or early next week. I see another question. Uh, this is from Mary. Was there a webinar slash training for applicants? Yes, we did. We love trainings on, <laughs> on the Office of Community Food Systems. It's just a really fantastic way to scale out our technical assistance. And so yes, we hosted several um, trainings for applicants. Um, in fact, I believe we hosted three. So we hosted one to the general public, we hosted one to state agencies, and then we hosted one for Indian tribal organizations. Now folks were able to attend all of them. You didn't have to be a state agency to attend the state agency uh, webinar. Um, so people had three opportunities to join us, and then we also made those uh, trainings available online. I have a question from Anne. Can we review the current RFA on your website? Fantastic question, Anne. Um, and that is one of the pieces of uh, support materials or documents that I'll send out to you all after um, 
after this training. The RFA is no longer available on our website because we just didn't want folks to kind of get confused about whether or not they could apply, but we will be sending out a PDF of the RFA to you all. And it's kind of your homework uh, to just peruse that document and make sure you're familiar with it and really have an understanding of um, the grant track types and our, our program. I see a question from Willie. He is asking, how many applications will be assigned and what is the length? These are questions that we are going to get into in that reviewer uh, team lead training, um, but I could do a spoiler alert. Um, generally speaking, um, you will not receive um, more than 10 applications. So that's the max amount of applications we will assign to a team. Folks will be um, assigned to groups of three. So your team will consist of three individuals, two reviewers, and a team lead. Um, and in terms of how long are the applications, it's really going to vary by your grant track type. Training grants tend to be a bit shorter. Those can be about 10 to 15 pages, uh, whereas um, the implementation uh, the implementation and planning grants could be a little bit longer, so you can be anywhere from 15 to, to 20 pages. Um, so, and there are a, a number of kind of um, supplemental materials that are attached to a grant application that you as a reviewer will not have to review closely, um, but I'll provide more instructions on that during our reviewer training next week and our team lead training. All right. Are we fresh out of questions, Andrea? I believe we are. Oh, man, look at us. We're so on time. Again, well, let me go through these last few slides. Let me not forget. So you guys, it's good to know that you guys are paying attention. So these dates are correct, the 16th and the 17th correct dates. However, the days are wrong. I am sorry, my oversight. I will update the days of the week on this um, in the actual slides that go out to you all. So the 16th is actually next Tuesday, and the 17th is actually next Wednesday. So uh, make sure that you know if you're a reviewer, attend the reviewer training. If you're a team lead, please attend the team lead training. If you have not, please mark down on your calendars. The review period is from January 29th through February 23rd. So you'll be a bit busy reviewing applications during that time. All of these trainings will be recorded, and I will make sure to email them to everyone for reference. And as I mentioned, all of these um, all of these resources will be hosted on the Partner website, Partner Web website, which you all will have access to um, by, by the week of January 22nd. So subscribe to the DIRT. That's our last plug. So we in OCFS, the Office of Community Food Systems, um, communicate out updates and highlights, um, webinar info, new resources, relevant news through our e-newsletter, e the DIRT. Um, so we highly recommend that you stay connected with us by, by subscribing to, to our newsletter. So again, a super big thank you. We look forward to you all joining us next week on Tuesday or Wednesday for the final trainings. Um, then the week of the 29th, you will start reviewing applications. All right, everyone. Take care. Have a fantastic day.